Hi folks, and welcome to another episode in this series on so-called static pressure fans. Following on from the evaluation that I presented in part 6, the conclusion that we can draw from these tests is limited to the fan's performance on this specific cooler, the copper version of the true. What I want to do now is to test the same fans again, but this time on a heatsink with lower fin density. And for that, I'm going to use the second revision of this same thermal right cooler, which is the perfect candidate for this particular test. And that is for two reasons. First, it has a lower fin density than the regular true, 47 fins versus 52. So the flow resistance will be lower. And interestingly, this also means that the surface area for heat dissipation has been reduced. Second, and perhaps more importantly, it has a neat little trick that you can only see if you look at the underside of the fin stack. There's a V-shaped hole in each of the fins, and this feature was implemented specifically to promote more turbulence in the flow passing through the heatsink. In order to make sense of the results from the upcoming tests, it's necessary for us to look a little deeper into the physics of what happens when air flows through the fins. So let's do that now. It helps to think of airflow in terms of pressure, and there are two pressures that we need to consider. First is the velocity pressure, which is relative to the speed at which air moves through a given system. And second is the static pressure, which, as we have already established, is caused by resistance to flow. In this system, it's the heatsink. Static pressure is relative to the density of the fluid, especially a compressible fluid like air, and therefore it pushes out equally in all directions. Because of this, it is added to the velocity pressure, giving us the value we call total pressure. When air is pushed through the fins of the heatsink, there will be an increase in velocity pressure and a decrease in static pressure. This phenomenon is akin to the Venturi effect, which is a working example of Bernoulli's principle. We are therefore able to infer that a given level of airflow through each cooler will be different in the following ways. The copper cooler, which presents higher resistance, will return higher flow velocity at lower pressure, whereas the aluminium cooler, which presents lower resistance, will return lower flow velocity at higher pressure. But that's not all. What about turbulence? Well, let's look at the curious design of the aluminium cooler's fins. When laminar flow reaches the V-shaped cutout, the contours of the aperture will impart a three-dimensional change in direction to the fluid streams, resulting in swirling eddies and vortices which will propagate through the interstices as turbulent flow. The advantage here is an increase in the rate of convection but it comes at the cost of greater noise, especially with higher speed fans. So that was a very simplified overview of how we can expect fluid behaviour to change quite markedly with different heatsinks. And there's definitely a lot more that could be said. One final point that I want to make before we look at the results is to remind you that whilst the airflow from axial fans is often represented as simple linear laminar flow, the actual flow pattern is more complex and will have turbulent and transitional regions of fluctuating pressure that are all being twisted by the rotation of the impeller. Anyway, with that said and done, let's look at these results. Okay, so this is the Vortex finishing its 1100 RPM run. So let's look at the intake temperature. It's maxed out at 22.4 and if we go over to the test still running look at the maximum load temperature 76 degrees maximum and the temperatures are very much tighter on this cooler than they were on the other cooler there's less of a spread and the maximum is unbelievably low compared to what it was with the 1600 rpm run and this shows even after having tested only one fan, that this cooler is a better performer, even though it has considerably less dissipation area and fewer fins. So this is the 
T30 doing its 1600 RPM run and I'm going to let you see temperatures over here. It's difficult for me to say decisively because I haven't collated the results at this stage yet. I've only tested six other fans. But early indications show that the T30 is no longer clearly in the lead and may actually be surpassed by some of the other fans. And this is really, really interesting. This is the Thermaltake Tough Fan doing its 1100 RPM run. And if I take you over here, you will see that this has broken 85 degrees. Now I'm not going to stop the test because it's only when it goes over 85 that I choose to stop the test. But this, so far, is the only fan out of the entire lineup to breach 85 degrees. So this is the A12X25 doing its 1600 RPM run on the Rev C cooler and I'm really interested to see if this fan is able to redeem itself after a distinctly mediocre performance in both tests on the previous cooler. Fingers crossed and here are the results. Now I've arranged them side by side so that it's easier to see the change in ranking. I certainly didn't predict this but I also didn't rule it out for the aforementioned reasons. The most significant change is with the Cooler Master Sickle Flow in the 1600 RPM test and this shows us why we cannot assume that a top performing fan is guaranteed to deliver the exact same performance on every heatsink. Each fan has its own unique airflow signature, if you will, which, when paired with a heatsink, will produce a highly complex and unique flow pattern and similarly unique thermal performance. Also, let's not ignore the Fantex T30's demise in both tests, beaten by lowly 25mm fans. Of course, this doesn't mean it's not a great fan, it clearly is. It's just that the extra airflow that it brings to the table is not advantageous in this arrangement. The question I asked before was simply, if it's not static pressure that is the determiner of a successful heatsink and fan pairing, what is it? And there just isn't a simple answer. It's a combination of various factors, and the results of this test demonstrate that turbulent flow is a big player in the cooling game. Comparing the heatsinks themselves, it's quite remarkable to me that the cooler with less heat dissipation area is able to perform the task just as well, and in the case of lower speed fans it performs even better, with not a single fan failing the thermal test. Anyway, I hope you've all enjoyed and learned something from this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching.